Okay, guys, we're live. Welcome back to another episode of Moffis Hours. This is episode number 21, The Problem with the Christ Pill. Um, really excited to get into this tonight. I'm hoping I've got some call-ins. I'm hoping I've got some guys that are willing to come in and uh, discuss and not necessarily debate, um, but there's some things that I'm a little bit fuzzy on as far as what's been going on in the church and sort of religion the last 10 years or so uh, since I've sort of been out of it. So I've got some community members that uh, I'm hoping maybe call in or just some guys I want to kind of call in and, and chop it up on this topic tonight. So um, let's just get started, man. Let's just, just jump right into it. So before that, before I talk about what kind of brought on this cast and what kind of brought on this topic tonight, uh, I thought it'd be interesting to share kind of my personal journey when it comes to religion and that kind of thing. So I'll uh, I'll do that first, and then I'll kind of get into why I overall think that um, there's some problematic things that, or some some stones left unturned when it comes to Christianity and religion, especially as it pertains to marriage and divorce and children, um, consequences, repercussions, accountability, all those kind of good things. So. So I'll kind of go back in the story. Uh, never raised religious. I come from a Catholic family. My dad was raised Catholic. We went to church until I was probably like two years old, but we didn't ever really go that often. And I remember going very infrequently and we didn't ever go as kids, essentially. Um, right around sixth grade, I guess I was probably 12 or 13 at that point. I had a couple of friends that uh, texted me and they're like, hey, you know, come to youth group with us tonight. We uh, we show up and it was actually a local church that was like half a mile from my house. So it was just right down the road. You know, we we go and we have an activity or like a we watch like a video or have a discussion around a certain topic. And then we have free time, like open gyms, like basketball, we'll play games and things like that. And I was like, all right, cool, like whatever. And, you know, I went and liked it and enjoyed it and had a really, really good time. And a little bit of a background on me and kind of my upbringing and my childhood, like I always had a little bit of a tough time fitting in as a kid, especially as a teenager and an adolescent. Um, I was sort of popular by proxy. So my good friends, my best friends growing up, played you know high school sports with and grew up playing little league and peewee football and all that kind of good stuff we were all really good friends and we all lived close sort of in the neighborhood but they were kind of like the popular popular kids like the good athletes one of my best friends growing up was you know quarterback of the football team prom king that whole thing right dated the prom queen whatever so uh so i was always good friends with them but i was never really in that same group i was kind of on that like I was an unpopular, popular kid, I guess, if you could say so. And I was an easy target, man, because I I grew up having pretty – I had sort of temper issues when I was a, when I was a kid. And I'm sure there's people who are like, oh, oh like imagine Muff being a temper issues. But, yeah, I, I had anger problems as a kid, and it was really easy for me to get riled up. And so, you know, teasing and bullying and – a lot of people will do it just to screw with you, especially kids. They'll do it to make fun of you, this and that and the other, and they'll try to see how riled up they can get you. And if you lose it, it's entertainment. It's funny for them. And so that was always you know, something that I had, had struggled with. And so I was picked on kind of a lot, and that trickled down, and I picked on other kids, and it was a whole thing, and it was really not good. But uh, the point I'm trying to bring in is it's all coming back. So I went to youth group. I went a couple times. I really liked it. And it wasn't the topic of discussion. It wasn't the content, like the Bible verses and the videos we watched. What was really interesting about this particular youth group that I went to is that it was very, very comfortable. It was very open. It was very come and be yourself. It was not preachy and proselytizing. And, you know, it was not sort of this, you know, white bread, milk toast sort of 
either the thing you get when you talk about like you're like a really like religious folk where everything you can't talk about this and that or you can't let f-bombs fly and again we're like 13 14 but the the people that ran this really treated the kids like adults or gave them that sort of leash they didn't police language they didn't tell us what we should or shouldn't do they kind of let us kind of run it and there was a, a lot of freedom and there was a lot of this sense of belonging and community that came along to it. And these were people that didn't know me. Like a lot of, there were some kids that were, went to my school that was in this group, but then a lot of other kids that went to this group were from other surrounding area schools that never knew me, that never spoke with me, had no idea who I was. And so I kind of had an opportunity to reinvent <clears throat> or start over with new relationships and new friendships with these people. And so this became something I looked forward to every single week. I really enjoyed going. I never was into the content, you know, super that much. I never grown up with it. I was kind of like, oh, like I didn't really understand it, but I was really into being able to get away and being around people that accepted me and that valued me and things like that. And I stuck with it for a long time. And we would do fun stuff too. We would take ski trips. We would do like fundraisers. Um, we do a lot of things as as a group and it wasn't always just like all jesus all the time it was very real world style applications it was very contemporary i guess is the best way to sort of put it and i did that for years and years did it all through middle school did it all through high school it was a really big part of you know my life in a way and I was really involved in it. And even into college, what eventually ended up happening is I had a couple of pretty religious roommates and I had always been sort of, well, I guess I should rewind. So my senior year of college um, or senior year of high school, <clears throat> myself and a couple other guys from the group, there was like four or five of us did one of these big like religious conferences out in Colorado over a week and, you know, very much drinking the Kool-Aid very much. Everybody's here together. Like they were in a, they were in a indoor basketball stadium. There must've been 10 or 15,000 attendees for this, for this camp and this um, conference, if you will. And yeah, man, when you get that many people together and you get, Everyone's sort of here for a common purpose. It's really powerful. It's really intoxicating. And it can really, really um, kind of insulate you and make you feel like you're really part of something. And so I you know, go to college. I, st I stayed local. I went to college in my hometown. And part of the reason was because I still had, you know, this, this group and this community that I was a part of. And, you know, I started to really get more into it. The, the people that actually had ran the youth group, had asked me if I would be an advisor for the middle school group. So the same group that I went through or that I grew up in, I went through the middle school group, then the high school group. And then they asked me if I would be sort of like an advisor or like a chaperone essentially and come to the weekly meetings for the middle school kids, kind of as a mentor, kind of as a leader, you know, things like that, go on trips, you know, all that, all that sort of stuff. And, you know, I remember being really, really involved with the contemporary stuff. And like, I was into it, man. I was in like, geez, man, I was in the church choir. I was in the um, contemporary church band that they created. I did, I gave sermons, like I spoke and I led worship. Like I was in it, man. And I had people coming up to me after I would do some of these and saying, like, have you ever thought about going to seminary school? If you got a real talent, real knack for it. And I was like, oh, yeah, like, no, like, appreciate it, this kind of thing. And I, I was really never sort of – I was really never into the whole religiosity of it. I was really never into the scripture. I was, I was really, really into the community, and I was really into how I felt when I was there. And I started to have these doubts that crept in or – you know, I would go to church because I was in the choir. So I would get up and go to church because I would sing in the choir and I would listen to the sermon and then I would go do whatever. I would do what every college kid does. I would go party and be a degenerate and run around with women and that kind of thing. And I kind of got some heat 
for that with people that knew me in the church, especially like other young guys that were around or young girls that were around that kind of knew me. And I kind of had to stop and think one day and it turned into, you know, when is the last time that I prayed? When is the last time that I took something from a sermon that the pastor gave and I took that as a lesson and sort of applied that to anything in my day-to-day life? And I racked my brain for it. I couldn't find anything. I couldn't figure out anything. I, just, I, I had no idea. And so like a lot of guys go and find the red pill, they go looking for answers. I started to do that with my own religion and my own sort of faith. And it's like, well, why is that? And the short answer was, I don't really believe this stuff. I don't really buy into it. I would say it and I would sing it and I'd be all about it. I'd be all about the community. I'd be all about the togetherness. I'd be all about the family aspect of it. And I don't remember exactly how I stumbled across um, – this particular video, I think I was watching some YouTuber who I won't plug here, but uh, he had been like, he had done a couple of videos. I'm like, oh, I'm an atheist and here's why this and that. And I watched some of this guy's stuff, not because of that. He had done some other stuff that I thought was really entertaining and this was just kind of part of his persona. But I, I stumbled across a video. I'm sure it's probably still somewhere on YouTube. You probably find it if you wanted to. Of It was a nine or 10 minute clip of Sam Harris at the University of Notre Dame during a debate um, with some, I, the name now escapes me, um, William Craig, I believe, Dr. William Craig, the Christian apologist. And he talks about how 9 million children die each year. Um, you know, there's a, there's a whole thing. It's kind of how he leads it off. And there's, there's it's, it's, it was pretty compelling stuff. And before I had found all this, let me actually, let me actually, take a step back because I didn't tell this part yet. So I took a Bible class. I got baptized at 21 years old, I believe. Became a church member just because I thought that was the next step in the process. I thought that that's what I was supposed to do. I thought that, all right, well, I'm part of the choir and I'm part of the, the contemporary you know, band and group. I'm an advisor for the kids. I've done and led worship. The next step for me is to be like a fully fledged member of the church. And I was kind of like a young figurehead in that community. And then just like that, I just took a step back and realized, whoa, like this stuff is, I, I don't, I don't, I don't believe any of it. And it really took me on this journey where I read and I read and I read and I discovered. And for a while, I was a very, very staunch, like anti-theist, atheist against all religion. All religions are bad ideas. There's no reason to believe any of it, things like that. When I moved to New York shortly after college, I was the guy that would like find the Jehovah's Witnesses in the subway when they were like flagging people down trying to give away their pamphlets and I would have debates with them. I would literally be like, oh, like this and that. Like, you know, and I look back on that and it was all kind of a waste of time. But I went to, you know, rally I went to a read the reason rally in 2020. No, it must have been 2014 or 2015. I followed all those guys like on Twitter. Um read a lot of Christopher Hitchens stuff, read Richard Dawkins. Um, Sam Harris, right? Those guys. And it was very similar to the experience I had when I kind of discovered the red pill, as we said, or unplugged. And um, yeah, I was really, really taken aback and really surprised by it. And so for a long time, I was in people's face about it. I was really, really, you know, like, no, there's no reason to believe this. And you, you realize quickly, like most people have no interest in religious debates. Like they don't even care. Or even if they do, it's mostly a waste of time. It's such a divisive issue and such a divisive topic that I sort of eventually came to the conclusion and the realization that it's not something really worth nuking entire familial relationships or friendships over. Um, I used to think that it was. I used to think that Anybody that believed or believed something like this, I couldn't possibly believe they're brainwashed and they need to, um, 
you know, they need to think about it more or they just, or whatever. I just, you know, I had this superiority complex and over the years I've really backed off on it. You know, I'm not really public about it. This is the first time actually ever that I've spoke about this publicly. So there you go. I've never told this story publicly to an audience or anything like that before. And I'm sure there's a lot of guys in the community. I'm sure that there's a lot of people that, you know, have watched my stuff for a while. They're hearing this for the first time. So here you go. Here, here you guys go. And so that's what kind of drew me to it, but also pushed me away from it. You know, I really loved the community aspect of it. I really liked the fact that I found a place that I belonged and that I was accepted as a kid and as an adolescent, and even as a young adult that didn't have a lot of that growing up from a peer group, you know, I really, really was brought in and I was kind of somebody It was pretty, it was really, really cool. And I really enjoyed that. But then I kind of realized that the house of cards fell and it was just because I was made something made me feel good. And just because it was something that gave me some meaning and some purpose doesn't necessarily mean it was true and doesn't necessarily mean that I should continue to go on believing it. Um, so that's kind of where I've found myself since, like, I don't really get into religious debates. Uh, I, I did, I do credit my ability and willingness to speak on certain topics and have debates and have arguments. I would say I used to watch a lot of clips from the atheist experience, which is like a public access show out of Austin, Texas. I guess they're still running. Uh, Matt Dillahunty is the host, and I haven't watched that stuff in a really, really long time, but I used to watch hours upon hours upon hours of YouTube videos and YouTube clips. They would have a live call-in show where they would have these kind of debates on air, and I think that's part of what's got me really good at being Socratic and having conversations and having debates and back and forth with people and just watching a lot of that and, and preparing for that. So. I do credit that with a, a lot of, you know, kind of what taught me on how to conver how to have conversations and how to, to, to have debates and things like that. But again, ultimately debates in itself and the act of debating is maybe not the best use of somebody's time, right? You know, it's the debating is for the debater. It's not really for the audience. So we don't have to go down that road, but that's, that's kind of where I've come from. That's kind of where I've been. Um, real quick, guys, if you want to call in and you want to talk about anything tonight, you know, the call in link or the join link is at the top pinned to the YouTube chat. If you're watching somewhere else like X or Facebook or Twitch, come on over to YouTube, smash the like button, join and watch here. It really helps out the channel. Um, it's 99, but 99 cents a month to become a member. You get access to the chat and that just really helps us out. It's not about money. We're not trying to get money from you guys, but we're trying to spread reach and spread the channel wide and reach more people. So you guys liking and subscribing and becoming members is, 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 is really helpful to that. So that's kind of where I've been on that journey since. You don't talk about it much. It doesn't really come up in my day-to-day -day life. Um, and look, there's a lot of guys in my community and Rich's community that are religious. There's a lot of guys that know I'm doing this talk tonight that, you know, may not agree with me. Um, and there's a lot of guys that are not religious and kind of feel the same way. And I used to be the kind of guy that would like look down on somebody or frown upon them if they believed and be like, Oh, you're stupid. You're an idiot. You're brainwashing. Like now I'm just like, look, man, we're all trying to do the best we can. And there are things that now that I prioritize as far as mindset, as far as work ethic, as far as um, an unplugged point of view that I value and that I prioritize way over somebody's religious beliefs or religious convictions. It's not the most important thing to me in the world anymore. It's way, way, way down the list. I mean, I could probably think of a dozen things that I would prioritize before caring about what somebody believed in. Um, so that's kind of that. Now, the point of this conversation and kind of the point of this discussion is that regardless of my own personal background and regardless of my own personal story, there are some inconsistencies and I think that there are some gaps that your trad cons these days and that religion and Christianity itself aren't really addressing. Um, and talking about a couple of specific examples, there seems to be, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll wait to get to the specifics, but here's, here's something that's, I'll just kind of spitball and kind of pontificate on some of these. One of the most common things 
you'll hear today from people are, you know, if you want to find a good girl, go find her at church. And I don't know how that got started. And I don't know based on what people think that's true. Um, I'll share the clip probably here in a little bit, maybe in a little bit later in the show, but there's kind of this girl that's going viral right now. Um, top zero one percent of only fans she was making a couple million dollars a year she came on the whatever podcast she had red hair she was talking about how she has fantasies of getting boyfriends and husbands to cheat on their wives and girlfriends with her and her her stuff's all over the internet like her only fans you can find it anywhere and she recently came out with this video and this reel of her being saved and born again and baptized and then she went on this five minute video explaining like her upbringing and how she was like a pastor's daughter and she was raised in a Christian household and it was these confines and these constraints. And so, I mean, I'll show the video a little bit later, but one of my main problems with this idea of, or with Christianity is that one of the fundamental tenets is that if you truly believe, and this is, you know, I'm probably paraphrasing. I'm sure there's a Bible verse that says something along these lines. But if you truly believe and you accept Jesus in your heart as your Lord and Savior, you will be saved. Sounds pretty innocuous at first glance, at first listen, right? Well, it's the ultimate get out of jail free card. It's the ultimate avoid accountability and responsibility for your actions and the things that you do in your life because you can be a serial killer serial rapist you can run and commit atrocities that people would shudder at you can be this terrible person that doesn't care about anyone but yourself you can be, indulge in horrible habits and horrible behaviors that kind of terribly terribly negative effects on other people, the people around you, your family, your friends, even strangers. And you can do this for your entire life. You can do this from the day that you're born into the day that you're on your deathbed and your final 60 seconds is ticking down. And as long as you do this, even if it's at the very last minute of your life, even if you have, it's on your last breath, you will be saved. You will enter the kingdom of heaven. You will enter this amazing place where nothing ever bad happens and you get to go be with God, you get to go be with Jesus. We're seeing this happening. I've seen it happen with this girl. I've seen it happen with another girl, actually, that I've, I tried to get on ladies night a couple of months ago. She was on OnlyFans at the time. She was with this agency and a couple months later, all of that's now gone. She starts preaching about God and Christianity and how she's becoming a Bible girl now and she's starting Bible study. And it's, and I think the thing that's most telling is that every most, not every, but the vast majority of the comments that I'm seeing are people that are supporting and being cheerleaders for this. Now I am all for somebody that made bad choices, made bad decisions and is trying to improve and do better in life. I'm all for that. But the problem I have is when you, you get to absolve yourself from all of this responsibility and you get to absolve yourself from any accountability, it's no wonder that women who are already have a very difficult time with any sort of responsibility and any sort of accountability for their actions – They've gone from, it's not my fault, he was abusive, because um, you know, those are things that people would be, are, are still skeptical on. He was abusive, emotional manipulator, you know, he wasn't the right guy, blah, blah, blah. And like, people have started to come around and be like, yeah, okay, like, are you just saying that or are you the problem? But it's like when a woman says, oh, well, I'm born again and I found God and I'm a Christian now. Okay, great. Yeah, you go queen, like whatever, whatever you say, like. There's no questioning it. There's no skepticism. It's all about, wow, what a powerful testimony. Wow, what, a, what an amazing transformation and spread, spread the good word and spread the good book. And it just makes me 
I don't know, man. It just makes me laugh. Like it, it just makes me – first of all, it's just like how does this happen? Like how can people not see what's going on? How can people be so blind to this? And I'm sure part of it is because if you're a believer and if you're somebody that subscribes to this, the more people that are spreading your message for you, the better. I'm assuming that's probably part of it. And two, I think a lot of it is just simply bullshit. I think a lot of it is just like, oh, yeah, queen, like you can do no wrong. You know, you're just amazing and I'm in awe of you. And there's people out there that are afraid to just say what everybody's thinking. Now, does she care what you think? No. Does she care that, you know, you point out that she had OnlyFans or that the Internet is forever or that no matter how many times she you know dunks her head under the water, she's not going to undo all that. No, she doesn't really care. So I understand there's no re there's no holding women accountable, right? We can already agree on that. There's no thing as holding women accountable. But this all goes into my next point when it comes to guys and when it comes to men. Pretty public case recently in this space. I've talked about it. I mentioned it before. Um, and again, I don't know this guy. I've never met this guy. I've never spoken with this guy. Rich does know him. He's met him. He's spoken with him. He, I guess, considers him a friend. I don't know exactly. I don't want to speak for him. But I do know there were parts of what Rich and I talk about that this guy rejects because of his faith. This guy's got multiple kids. This guy's got a pregnant soon to be ex-wife, but he just recently announced in the last few weeks that he's getting divorced. And this guy was a very prominent, I believe, when I understand, figurehead in sort of this Tradcon, Christ pill sort of space. And what guys seem to not understand and what guys seem to be falling victim to, and if they don't understand this and they choose to turn the other way and turn a blind eye, they really leave themselves open to risk. Marriage within itself isn't necessarily a Christian institution, but it's become one. It's become synonymous with a Christianity and religion, right? A covenant with God. Like marriage has been around for way longer than Christianity has existed. But apparently, like Christians love to say that they came up with marriage or they love to say they invented it. And that's fine. You guys can have it. I don't care. But when you subscribe to this, that is the next step. It's very, from what I understand, it's looked down upon, it's frowned upon to not be married, especially to someone that's mothering your children, trying to raise your children. If you're looking in a church community, you need to be married. That's said, right? Like the marriage is a covenant between you three and God. That's all part of the part of the package. And so this other aspect of faith comes into this, right? Where I can sit here and say 50% of Marriages end in divorce. Women are leaving men 70% of the time. You stand to lose your house. You stand to lose your access to your kids. You stand to lose access to half your shit. But the answer to that, as opposed to go get a prenup or go get a lawyer or go protect yourself under the eyes of the law as much as humanly possible, or better yet, avoid inviting the state and the government into your relationship in general, the answer to all that is just have faith that it'll work out. And if you pray harder and you just love God more and you abide by those principles and you just be a better Christian, that will somehow protect you or insulate you from the harsh realities of divorce and what happens. And that is the crux of the issue. Trusting in God, having faith, being a good Christian, abiding by Christian principles does not insulate you from the harsh, real, biological implications of women, of their mating sexual strategy, of hypergamy. And so to sit here and say that as long as we're you know under the eyes of God and we have a great relationship with God, we'll be okay, I, I just don't see it. And instead of understanding female nature and instead of taking the necessary precautions and understanding how 
hypergamy works and understanding your duties to maintain your household in a way that you see fit, not necessarily what you get out of a book or whatever that says, it really, really misses the mark. And so that's where I think this whole God pill or Christ pill and this Tradcon thing really screws a lot of people up because it is the cold, hard, harsh truths about male and female nature are really nowhere to be found in those books or any Holy Scriptures, as far as I know, as far as I can tell. If somebody wants to correct me, somebody wants to come up on the screen or wants to join the conversation, you're, you're absolutely more than welcome to. But because again, and one of the criticisms that I heard recently um, from a guy in my own community was that, you know, well, the Bible teaches one thing, but the church teaches another. I said, I guess, I mean, I don't know. I'm not part of that community anymore. I don't know what the church is really. So, so my take is my, my assumption or so what I'm hearing is that the church is really just telling guys like, hey, man up and marry that girl. Right. You know, just do it. As opposed to what the Bible says, like, you know, the man's the leader of the household. There's a lot of stuff in there about like, I mean, this is paraphrasing, but like women should be seen and not heard. Like there's definitely stuff like that and modesty and things like that. So, but that doesn't necessarily solve the problem because again, trusting that a woman is going to choose a logical thing, which is faith, like, cause you got to choose to believe in something. You got to make an active choice to believe. A belief is not something you're just born with. It's just not something you have. Now you can be, I don't want, I mean, you could use the term indoctrinator. You could be raised in a certain way that this belief becomes something that's part of you, but belief is a choice. Belief is not something that you inherently have. So what you're doing is you're saying, well, you are rolling the dice, basically trusting that your woman, your wife, is going to let her logical brain of her belief override her female natural mating impulse of hypergamy, right? So I think that's where it misses the mark. And that's ultimately what my issue is with it, is that there's no answer to this. There's no answer other than just be a better Christian. Well, what does that mean? Or just believe harder, have more faith. Somebody's free to come explain it to me, but that's kind of overall the problem that I have. Um, I'll share a little bit of this video for you guys, just so you can kind of see what I mean. And you guys might, um, might remember this girl if you've ever seen one of these podcasts, but I started about two minutes in, so I'll just kind of get to it and we'll do a little bit of commentary personal, personal experience with you. So I reached out and did corn for four years. Um, and I showed myself all over the internet. I said crazy things on podcasts. If you don't know the, I love cheating podcast. Um, she essentially went viral for this clip where, you know, she had this fantasy of cheating. She went on whatever with those guys and she had this cheating fantasy or something where she, would actively try to get guys to cheat on their girl, cheat on their wives, or that was more attractive to her. She would actively like seek those guys out. So that's some definitely, that's some context. Um, and so I met this person who's now my partner and he truly showed me God's love. He was sending me Bible verses, praying over me, and we were just friends. So, so some simp decides that he wants to play Captain save -a while this girl is on the internet getting plowed on camera, doing porn. And this guy is sending her Bible verses saying, oh, I can save her, right? Like this, this is what the, these, this is the kind of man that the church is churning out. I mean, where is this dude's self-respect? We were just friends at the time. And she apparently, you know, there was an article written maybe a, two years ago that came out and she was living in this mansion making like, I don't know, 40,000 bucks a month or something like that. And she was living and dating this other OnlyFans creator. I'm guessing this is not that guy. I'm guessing they split up. And she's now gotten big enough and popular enough and is in the public eye enough that I think 
she's coming to this realization that if she wants a family, she wants to get married, she wants to settle down one day, she's got to stop this. She's got to put this away. And here comes Mr. You know, God pill Captain Sabaho sending her Bible verses as just friends, all the while she's getting plowed on camera. So here we go. like the Holy Spirit was truly working and moving, but I was in such a rebellion. Whatever that means. Like, what is the Holy Spirit moving and working? Can we can we define this? I mean, is this just a feeling? Can can you explain this? Is this does this manifest itself in any sort of reality? <laughs> against it because I was like, God doesn't love me. I've had to work this hard for this many years because no one cared about me. My family didn't care about me. Christianity is a cage. It's not Christianity. It's religion. Yeah. That's, that's one of my favorites too. Like what's the difference? I'm earnestly asking, what's the difference? Like when, when people use language like this, it's, it's very tricky and it gets frustrating because you can replace those words with anything, right? You know, like there was a video that came out a couple of years ago, maybe like 10 years ago. And this guy was like this street preacher. And he was like, Jesus is the solution. Religion is the problem. And it's like, you I, you could just swap out any terms that you want in that situation. You could say like, Pepsi is the problem. Coca-Cola is the solution. <laughs> like you can insert really anything you want. They're just, unless you explain and add more context, let's see if she does religion is the cage and unfortunately i didn't have like good role she didn't she didn't explain what that meant that's just you know some nonsense models growing up my parents my siblings i didn't have good friends i truly fell into darkness and i was like i said i was top 0.01 percent creator like that is crazy that is a crazy milestone to reach in that industry so I made what I made. I did what I did. She made millions. And she talks about like, again, see how she's passing the buck. She was raised in a traditional Christian household. Her father was a pastor. She was the middle child of five. I mean, I don't know what to believe. I don't know if, if, if she was neglected. I don't know if she's telling the truth. I mean, I know where I'd put my money. But I mean, if we're talking about a, from what I understand, a close knit Christian community and a pastor's daughter, um, aren't they supposed to be like, and again, like, this is what I mean. When somebody tells me, go find a girl at church, I think of this girl. But I want to share you, share with you guys the truth of it all, because I am now giving it all up for Christ. I am now truly a believer. I would never take it back. God radically saved me from this darkness. And let me tell you again, the devil has a budget. So she went on OnlyFans, did porn. She went on enough podcasts. She got enough internet hate. She realized that the purses and the Gucci bags and the clothes and the cars and the shoes and the mansion were ultimately unfulfilling. And she's, I'm sure she's keeping the money, though. I don't think there's anything out here about her donating her money or um, everything that she made or selling off of her, all of her worldly possessions to, you know, clothe or feed the homeless or charity or anything like that. Let's find out. We won't show the whole thing, but let's keep going. But God does not. God Again, more, more nonsense. The devil has a budget, but God does not. What does that mean? Explain that to me, please. Literally made you he made this world he made the heavens like what makes you think that god can't bless you with anything but the devil will give you these things that trip you up and money in front of your face and these worldly friends your family that doesn't isn't there for you you know but don't be discouraged because god has a better plan for your life yeah we're not going to watch the rest of this but all i'm hearing is it's not my fault it was the devil I didn't have good friends. I didn't have good family. There's nothing in here about I made poor decisions because I made bad judgment. It's a more refusal to be accountable, more refusal to be responsible for your own actions, passing the blame and passing the buck onto others. And now you get to reap all the benefits of the devil, which is all of this money and fame and things like that. And But now you get to be completely absolved of all of these things. 
because you're accepting Jesus, I guess. And it's the ultimate, it's the ultimate, ultimate cop out. And here's the thing that people don't understand. Like accepting Jesus and becoming born again, it doesn't turn you into an actual virgin. If I took a car off of a lot and I drove it 100,000 miles, went and fixed the odometer so it said zero, took it back to the dealership, it's not a brand new car just because I put the odometer back to zero. It still has 100,000 miles on it. And it's the same thing when you talk about promiscuity and women with high body counts and the experiences and the things that she's been through. Like None of that stuff is erased. As much as she wants it to be, it won't be. And whoever this simp is that waited while she got plowed on camera and being the good little beta boy that he is, sending her Bible verses. And notice how she said partner. Women that look at their man like he's the best thing since sliced bread don't use the term partner. Um, I don't know. Hannah, you can not watch on X and you can come over to YouTube if you want to come on here. If you guys, if you guys are watching on X or Facebook or anywhere else, come watch it on YouTube. Um, YouTube.com slash The Unplugged Alpha. You can come in here and join uh, the conversation. If you want to have a conversation on this, you're absolutely welcome to. Um, let's see. A little super chat here. I'd call in Michael off the rails and humbly recommend reading Sermon on the Mount by Emmett Fox for more based metaphysical view on Christianity. Seriously and loving the same. For the... Look, uh, look, man, like here's my thing. Like, I don't, I don't know why – I can't, why can't I just read the Bible? Why can't I just read the text? Why do I need to read someone else's interpretation and someone else's interpretation of the metaphors and someone else gets to tell me what's true or what's literal and what's allegorical? If this is the supposed word of God written by God himself, then why isn't it the most painfully clear, black and white, clear as crystal set of rules and set of guidelines that have ever been written? If why isn't it isn't it supposed to be perfect? That's my question. I should just be able to go to the source material. I shouldn't I shouldn't need for anybody else to explain it to me through their lens. And that's how these gymnastics and apologetics start. So, but this is what a lot of guys will fall for. And this girl, like not this girl, the other girl I was talking about, the girl that I tried to get on ladies night, like if you didn't know before that she was on OnlyFans, you wouldn't know it now. It's been completely erased from all of her socials. Like you wouldn't know whatsoever. So some guy is unwittingly going to get with this girl, fall in love with her, maybe buy her a house, have kids, whatever, and maybe go through the divorce meat grinder because of her checkered past. And it's just, I don't see the nobility in it. I see this as the ultimate get out of jail free card. I see this as the ultimate avoidance of accountability. And I think if guys were more honest with themselves and they really took their medicine, because a lot of guys want to reject this kind of stuff. Like a lot of guys want to reject female nature, even guys that are consider themselves red pilled or like they're in this space. I mean, I've talked about this particular person, who again I respect him. I like his work. He's gave, like I, I like a lot of the stuff that he's done. I'm not saying he's a bad guy, and I know I'm not saying his name, but I don't want to cause any issues. And people that kind of know should know. And I, I mean this man, no disrespect, but this idea that it's like, well, just should have. Christianity harder or should have been a better one or should have just listened or prayed more or should have went to God. None of that stuff to me fixes or solves the issue. And until men take responsibility for themselves and learning about how women operate and learning about female nature and understanding hypergamy, they're going to be doomed to repeat this cycle. And so I don't believe this is enough. I'm not saying don't believe in God. I'm not saying don't be a Christian if that's what you want to do. And this isn't meant to be a debate on whether Christianity is true or on whether Christianity is false. I'm not really interested in that. I mean, we can have that conversation another time. 
um, if anybody really wants to. But that's not really the direction of this channel. I'm not really looking to do that. But my point is, there's some fundamental issues that I have with the people that subscribe to this kind of stuff and like the God pill, and the trad pill. And it's, there are parts of it that encourage men to actively ignore these things. Just have faith. Just pray harder. Make sure she's God-fearing and believes. Well, guess what? Women reserve to change their minds about anything at any given time. We got about 15 minutes. Um, there's somebody back here, but they're not connected, so I'm not sure what's going on. You got to connect your microphone and your camera. I see you're behind the screen. Um, let me run the ad reel real quick, and if there's anybody that wants to call in, please do. Uh, again, if you're watching somewhere else like X or Twitch or Facebook, come over to YouTube. Uh, support and watch here really helps. I'll be back in about a minute and 43 seconds. This episode is brought to you by the Unplugged Alpha Supplements and Grondike Soap Company. Brothers, if you're like me and you take what you put in your body seriously, you'll want to use the Unplugged Alpha Supplements. An obsession with absorption is what sets this line apart from the others. You want to make sure that you absorb as much of the supplements as possible so you don't end up peeing out expensive urine. My supplement line is made in the United States from the highest quality domestic ingredients. And unlike cheaper supplements from China and plastic bottles, Mine ship in dark glass bottles to keep your supplements fresher, longer, and won't seep endocrine disrupting plastics into your supplements. Nothing is a hard tablet. Everything is in an easily digestible, bioavailable capsule. You can filter all products by various categories, including testosterone support, estrogen metabolism, fat burning, immune health, sleep support, and performance. Visit theunpluggedalpha.com forward slash shop and use the subscribe and save option to get 10% off your supplement orders or use coupon code alpha10 for 10% off a one-time order to try it out. And I use Tactical Soap and God of War beard oil every day. Tactical Soap is a handmade product made in the United States from ingredients you can actually pronounce, not conventional endocrine lowering toiletry chemicals. Both the soap and the beard oils are infused with bioidentical pheromones that are designed by a clinical psychologist and pheromone expert to maximize attractiveness, to the opposite sex. Go visit coopersoap.com and get 10% off your order today. Guys, check out my website at richcooper.ca for more information on booking me for coaching, my community, my courses, and a whole bunch more. You can also find all the useful links pinned below in the top YouTube comment of all my videos. Now let's get on with the show. All right, let's get on with the show. Sorry about, just pop something in. So I'm gonna snack on this real quick. I'm gonna go on mute for about five seconds. And we're back. All right, let's get to. I got two callers back here. Let's get to N. N hey, you can you hear live. me? Hey, man, what's going on? Hey, uh, we know each other. I'm in your community. Hey, what's up, dude? Hey, uh, I consider myself a Christian, but I have a really, really hard time with the no sex before marriage thing, and that's what I've been struggling on. Because um, you know how bad marriage is in the West, and I hear these women on dating apps saying I'm a born again Christian, but like Rich says, they're not virgins, so that's really been like what's been catching me and I can't get kind of can't get past that in my head, that concept of no, no sex before marriage, but the women aren't virgins. They aren't pure. And they're saying, Oh, well, you know, I was just born again. I, I, I found God. Um, I want to get your thoughts on that. A lot of it I think is LARPing. I mean, anytime I hear women say I'm born again, I'm like, <sighs> to me, I don't, I wouldn't entertain it. I mean, look, like everything comes back to, if you're that guy or not. Women make rules for betas, they break rules for alphas, right? We know this. So anytime a woman is trying to impart some sort of rules, some sort of purity, some sort of line in the sand to sort of protect herself, you kind of have two options. You can take her at face value and you can just say, whatever, it's not even worth dealing with. I'll just next her and move on. Or you can say, listen, I guess we'll find out, right? Because I've been on plenty of dates with women that are like, oh, I'm so feminist. I'm so this. I couldn't believe anybody ever would vote for X, Y, Z. And I'm like, yeah, I did. Yeah, I'm not like that at all. I think feminism is fucking stupid. And at first, it's like shock and indignation. I can't believe you would say that. How could you? And I'm like, yeah, well, you know, that's just the way it is. I think it's all BS. And, you know, if you don't want to go out anymore, it's totally cool. But it's just not my thing. 
Yeah, that you makes can sense. Do it in the right way, but you have to own it. You got to own it, right? Like, there's nothing worse than being wishy washy and being apologetic because women will respect a guy that stands on something, but they can't respect a dude that is like tiptoeing around stuff because she'll she'll clearly be able to see that you're seeking her approval. You're trying to find the right way to answer so that she doesn't get mad or upset, right? So if you run into a girl that's like, yeah, I'm born again. You know, I'm not going to have sex before marriage. I'm celibate. You have to kind of decide for yourself, is it really worth my effort to see if this girl is for real? Uh, and it depends. Are you really into her? Do you really dig her vibe? Are you really attracted to her? Do you guys have a lot of stuff that, you know, does she, could she, you see yourself, could you see her adding value in other ways to your life, et cetera? Um, or not. I mean, so that's something you got to kind of decide for yourself. Um, but yeah, like when girls say stuff like that, dude, like I almost never take statements like that from a woman seriously. It's most of the time it's things like that to weed out betas. It's to weed out guys, um, you know, or, or it's to weed out people that are just like, oh, whatever. Like, I just want to screw us to this and that and the other. And you still may be that guy. So you just kind of have to decide how much work you're going to put into it. If it's worth, you know, trying to flip her or figure out if she's for real or not, or if it's just, if you're better off, you know, taking that time to more um, sexually open prospects. Yeah, that totally makes sense. And I, I really respect a virgin. Like if a woman was young and she said, look, I'm a virgin, I'm saving myself. Oh, I'd really? be like, wow. Yeah. <laughs> like I respect that. But if she's really? not, yeah. it's like, that is so stupid. Like I lose all respect for her when she says something like that. Um, but anyways, one thing I wanted to leave you with is I'm a Christian. I believe there's a lot of problems with the church. I think it's a beta factory. But at the same time, I think about where my soul's going to go and what's going to happen when I die. Like, is hell a real place? So just kind of leave you with those thoughts, like something that goes through my head a lot, you know, what happens in the afterlife? Yeah. I mean, look, man, I've, I've had these conversations with myself and um, I've heard every argument in the book I've heard of past, you know, I know about Pascal's wager. I mean, I know about, I mean, we could talk about the watchmaker argument. We could talk about argument from design. We could talk about a whole bunch of stuff. And I think, you know, like, look, like, I, like, like I said before, I am far less concerned with somebody's religious beliefs now, especially as guys that I want to be around and guys that are in my community. I generally think that guys who do believe are pretty stand up guys and they believe in the right things. And there's a lot of good things that are taught in the Bible. And there's a lot of good things that are sort of shared by Christians in this collective. But my thing is, it's like, I still think you can be a good person without that book. Now, look, like I said, I have another list of priorities that I need a guy to check off on the box before I'm like, this is a dude that I would want next to me, a guy in the foxhole, guy protecting my my six and that sort of thing. So I don't give as much weight to it as my, anymore. I'm happy to have a discussion with anybody about it anytime, but it's certainly not a deal breaker to me by, by any means. Um, you know, and it's like, I'm, I'm cool with guys that are, I'm cool with guys that aren't. And that's just kind of the long and short of it. Got it. Cool. Yeah. I just want to get your thoughts on that, but um, yeah, I'll let the other caller uh, chime in. It's good talking cool. to you. Bob. Yeah, man. Likewise. Right on, bro. See ya. See ya. All right. Odin's anvil. What's going on, man? G'day. How are you? Can you hear me? Yeah, man. Loud and clear. Great. Excellent. Nice to talk to you. So I got a bit of a question. unique, you got a unique perspective on something you might appreciate. I was a total degenerate in my early twenties, right up until basically late twenties when I met what quote unquote a good woman. And she really reined me in. Um, during that time, I started going to worship and uh, got quote unquote saved again, new, born again, new, t new, uh, new Testament Christian. And then I started seeing the holes in it. And then I started, and then I realized exactly what religion is. Religion is an operating system. It doesn't matter what religion it is. It's an operating system. iOS, Android, Buddha, Buddha, Buddhism, Judaism, doesn't matter what it is. So when, what happens is, is people get indoctrinated and zealoted, and then they, they put the blinders on. Some operating systems do not process data in the same way that others do. And so what, a lot, what is a lot of these Christian guys, and Catholics specifically, are facing is that their operating systems do not process the information that is being presented to them. It's the blinders. It's the scales on the eyes, as to use biblical terms, 
it's the blue pill lens, it's whatever you want to call it. But it's just the operating system as opposed to the operator. And what you can do is you can wake people up to that, which is what you guys are doing with the, with the show with Rich. But I found that through myself because of my own lived experience. I was a bodybuilder in my 20s with all the, with all the trimmings and sides that comes with that. And I, now I'm in my mid-30s and I'm recently divorced. I've got a kid. You know, I'm going through the divorce machine. You know, thank you very much again, Rich and Moff. You guys have helped me through that immensely. The, the operating system, though, worked for me because I didn't have an example to live by in my early 20s. That example, my father was a, is a great man, but he's ex-military, special forces. We could go on a long story about that. And he wasn't a pleasant person to be around in my early 20s, in my, in my youth. And then so I distanced myself from him. I didn't have a strong masculine role model. And then what happened was, is I fell into the heavy crowd. And then again, they're not the best role models. A skin of my teeth that I ended not, I didn't end up in jail a couple of times. And the operating system, I needed that. I needed that operating system, but I saw the holes in it. But a lot of people can't because of the zealoted lens that they look through. And that's, I think, what you're trying to hedge at. Because a lot of Christian men know what's going on, but a lot of Catholic men do not. Because a Catholic is not a Christian. That is a conversation we could have if you wanted. But yeah, that's just let it off for that perspective. Well, so what's the solution, right? Like, I think the solution, I think the solution is realizing that the, the Christian New Testament, which is the which is the gospel, the good news of Christ, Christian men need to look at the fact that that was written under a 2,000-year-old operating system. That was 2,000 years ago that was put together, that those, script, those scriptures were written, and then they were compiled as a King James Bible. But again, the social convention has changed drastically. Like, you're, you, you know, um, Apex Mindset's got a really great series on retroactive jealousy. If anyone's interested in that, check him out. He's awesome. That, you know, we're only designed for retroactive jealousy for one, maybe two, maybe three partners with your woman. But now you're getting to date a woman who's sexually marketable in her, early, in her mid to late 20s. She might have a body count of 50. You know, so the, the social convention has changed. And then so what people do is they use religion as an excuse. And then they use it as a, oh, well, I'll just get saved. Like you mentioned earlier, 30 seconds before your death, I repent my sins. And now I'm good. I don't think that that's the way that that's going to roll. If maybe in like, I think that asking for forgiveness is one thing, but actually getting it is another. You know, there's um, lots of there's a. I've been to quite a few sermons. Not two weeks ago, locally where I live here, where uh, I listened to a sermon for almost an hour on forgiveness. And there's people that have I've done things to, and just as like everyone else, and think people that think have done things to me, that they carry burden around. But the the, the hardest thing to forgive is to, to forgive yourself. And then that's what that's what the religion offers. It doesn't matter what religion it is, because I went looking for that, you know, renounce my sins and get saved, become a Christian, all these kind of things. But the only way out of that is lived experience. Out is lived experience observing the world. And if someone's wearing the filtering lens of zealotry, they will never see it. It's like putting your finger in a glass of water. As soon as you remove your finger, the impression is gone. And it's unfortunate. It's unfortunate, but. You can just ask questions. You know, I ask questions. Do you think that this is going to serve you? Do you think that this is going to serve your family? You know, is marrying this woman who you met at the bath six months ago who has two kids from two different men, is that a good idea? That's a conversation I had with a guy a few years ago before I unplugged fully because I only read the Rational Mail maybe three or four years ago. Yeah. You know, I didn't know. This stuff was just lived experience for me because I was, a, again, I was a bodybuilder in my 20s and I was a total degenerate. So, you know, it's... But I do think one of the issues is that like modern Christianity and modern religion is saying, yes, that woman is redeemable and all she can be saved and yeah. she is all an I she's a child of God and you know, just have faith and things will work out. Just be a man of God. And it doesn't say look at the red flags, it doesn't say understand how red flags and past history can affect future behavior. And those are the I things agree with that you. they're putting those blinders on. Yeah. So it's I like I agree with you. So it's a, it's a, it's big nuance. I get it. And I think, look, like, and I, like I said, there was the church and the church community that I was a part of was a very, very useful and necessary part of my adolescence and like my, my growing up. Like, I don't know kind of where I'd be without it, without that sense of community. Like I had a pretty you know rough go of it as a, as a, as a teenager. Um, and that was a very much needed reprieve every week or a couple times yeah. a week, I especially I as a kid. That. 
Yeah, yeah especially I wish I as had a that. kid. Yeah. And, you know, do I do I still think there's value in it? Sure. Do I think though that drinking too much of that Kool-Aid, like you said, kind of get those blinders on and and it doesn't seem like <clears throat> whatever's being taught in the modern church is is accounting for these things, is accounting is for it, these facts. And so are you familiar are you missing. familiar with a are you familiar with the story of the cleansing of the temple? No. Okay. G- Crosswalk kicks the door in on the central worshiping place where the cult is run out of, and he removes the bankers, the money collectors, and the tax the money changers and the tax collectors from the place of worship and all their cattle out of their place of worship. That's the reason he was executed on Calvary. Last supper, they're sitting around, crossed in his 12 homeboys like, yo, man, you got to skip town. He was executed because he was a political dissident because he defunded a cult. That's the reason why. So Pontius Pilate said, what did you do? He said, oh, I went into the went into the central place and I defunded it. What's happened is the Catholic Church is a product of those men that were defunded. The Catholic Church is a cult. And I could, and I could, we could go into a long, in-depth argument, a discussion about this if you wanted. But the, the ins and outs of it is Mark... Uh, Matthew 6, John, J- Jesus is down at the river and John the Baptist says, teach us how to pray. And he says, it's easy. Do not pray like the pagans do for they think for their many chatterings, they will be heard. Do not fall into vain repetition and goes on and on and on and describes how to do it. And the Catholics do all the opposite of that. Catholics walk in, they put a do- make the sign of the cross, walk into the building, put a dollar in the box, stand up, sit down, kneel, listen to some guy yell at them in, in Latin. They get the, They get the bread, they get the wine get the sign of the cross. Oh, you're a good Catholic. You come back on Wednesday for confession. I mean, again, that's not biblical. None of the things in the Catholic church are scripture. The Catholic church is a cult. And I realized that quite quickly after I read the the New Testament front to back. The second time I read it front to back, I was blatantly aware. And I've had this discussion with priests and they have nothing to say about it. Because again, Christ said, no man is above another. Well, what is the Pope? Why does the Pope get to make decisions? Your relationship with God is supposed to be between with you and you and yourself, and it's between yourself and God, not yourself, God, the priest, and everyone else, and in the in the congregation. I mean, worship any two gather in my name. So what's happened is, is that like the last caller said, the Catholic Church and most organized religions are beta factories because they are extensions of the government, and it doesn't matter what way you want to look at that. You can look at it through the lens of the monarchy and how they their interactions with the Catholic Church. Uh, the uh, original colonials and the, and, the, and the relationship with the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church was, funded the Nazis at the beginning of the Second World War. Like, you can go on and on and on and on. Catholic Church changes its mind frequently. Again, that's not scripture. They just came out a couple of years ago and said um, purgatory doesn't exist. Again, that was never in the Bible. It was never in the Bible. So what what's happened is, is people have got away from the actual operating system, which Christ left and was explicit in his instructions. Which makes no argue, which makes no mistake. Christ says that people will do what is best of best interest of them, and to the to the disadvantage of you. If given the opportunity, you should be on guard. And it's like, and what is what is being a man and entering in a relationship with a with a woman? If you're you're vetting them to make sure that you're not getting in the situation where I am now, where I'm divorced and I'm getting run through the divorce grinder. You know, they, it's. I'm very passionate about it because I see a lot of people. I know a couple of good men that married women that were not the best for them. And they thought, oh, yes, I'm going to be a great Catholic and everything's going to be great. But it's not. It's the, uh, are you still there? Oh, yeah. I'm just listening, man. Yeah. Have you got any questions about that? I could talk about this for another hour. It's, I just no, I mean, I'm sure, it. dude. You're, uh, you're on quite a, quite a tangent there. No, no, no. I mean, it's interesting stuff, man. Listen, like, I, it's something that, I know Catholics have their own thing, the way they do it, you know, I mean, and, but there's also like, I don't know how many denominations of Christianity, f- tens of thousands. Um, and so, you know, that in itself is a red flag to me. The fact that we can't yeah. all get along on one thing or figure out if, if, again, it goes back to my question earlier is if it's so simple to understand and if this is the truly perfect and unchanging word of God, then why are there so many yes. different interpretations or why isn't it so easy to understand and why is yeah. it so, why do I need somebody to translate it for me? Why is it in a, you know, coming from a language that doesn't exist anymore? And then so yeah. there's, there's a lot of questions that it raises. So. Yeah, there's a huge amount, and it's never ending. And the fact of the matter is, we'll never get to the bottom right. of it because the people who own the original scriptures will not let them be viewed. 
And then, so you never really know. So all I take in, and that's what happened with me is I got saved. Like I was a happy clapper born again, you know, every Sunday, cry, tears running down my eyes, absolutely passionate about it. Yeah, and then I realized, right. and then I realized it's an operating system. And I, and I, now I still go to worship, but I know what it is. It's a sense of community. It's a sense of brotherhood. There's some of the, the best people that I've ever met in my life in my 35 years of being on this earth have been members of the community that are of, of the Christian faith. And it's, I think it's the it's just the operating system, the sense of the community that I get from it. But I do I do I think that Christ is the Son of God? I don't know anymore. I don't right. know. He was a real person that walked the earth. But the problem is, is that a lot of people that's blasphemy. What I just said. Yeah, oh, you're, yeah, that's blasphemy, right. Eddie. You know. So yeah. Well, listen, man. I appreciate it. Um, yeah. Yeah, Colin's really interesting. Maybe we do a part two of this, and we can go on a little bit of a tangent. I try to keep these tight to around an hour. Yeah, but, absolutely. Um, yeah, man. Thanks for calling in and uh, see the future Mike show, I'm sure. Likewise, yeah. bro. Bye. All right. All right, guys. Let's wrap right there. Um, interesting conversation. I wish I got a couple more call-ins. I know there's some guys that are kind of watching this at home. Like I said, man, like I'm down to do another part two. You guys let me know in the comments if you want to do something like this again. This is kind of just my general thoughts toward this. I am open to having a conversation with anybody about this. Um, I've haven't done any sort of like formal religious debate ever. Uh, I'm more than happy to have guys come on and like, it's respectful, man. Like, it's just look like I, I, I'll be hard pressed to get my mind changed, but I remain open to having my mind changed on any given subject in a given time. If the right evidence is presented and it's something that I think makes sense. So uh, yeah, man, fun show. Um, got uh, another ladies night coming up on Monday, the unplugged alpha next Wednesday. Um, not much more for me, man. I've got some, some personal updates that I might be sharing with you guys a little bit soon. And, uh, please like, please become a channel member and subscribe. Please leave a comment really helps out the channel. Appreciate the support. Uh, again, if you guys are watching this somewhere else, I encourage you to come watch on YouTube. If you would, it really helps out the channel, helps us get a wider reach. And then obviously you can call in and you can kind of be part of the show. And if you have something you wanted to ask a question on or be part of, um, if you're looking to get in touch with me, best place to reach me is on Instagram at moft underscore unplugged. Um, ask me about my community. Ask me about private coaching. Uh, you can send me an email at mofficehours at gmail.com if you have something you want to see me cover or you want to get something as far as clarity on, on a particular topic or issue. Uh, I'll try to see if I can get a, another mailbag segment for you guys next week because I really like doing those. So if you have anything that you maybe don't want to book a coaching call for um, that you'd like me to see me do sort of on a video as a video request or a, a, a request live on the show, if you don't have time to call in, that's the best way to do it. But as always, guys, do the work. Let's run the uh, outro, and we'll catch you guys next week, same time, same place. Peace. All right, guys. If you enjoyed that podcast, make sure you visit my website at richcooper.ca to learn more about my courses, my book, The Unplugged Alpha, community, or booking me for private coaching. Also, if you are a Canadian with $15,000 or more of credit card debt and what you are doing right now isn't paying off the balances, then visit totaldebtfreedom.ca and hit Get a Free Quote to see if you qualify to settle your credit card debt for less than you owe today over the next 48 months. Make sure you check out the top pinned comment on YouTube for all the links mentioned during the show. Peace.